on the 29th of June, and we'd like to call this special meeting of the Santa Barbara Airport Commission to order. And we'll begin with the uh, roll call. Karen Kahn. Present. Kirk Martin. Craig R. Curry. Carl Hopkins. Here. Dolores Johnson. Here. Bruce Miller. Here. Jim Wilson. Here. Thank you. Uh, the next thing we have is public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled before them that same day. Total amount of time for public comments is 15 minutes, and no individual may speak for more than two minutes. I have one slip. Are there any others? I'm not aware of any other slips, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, George Sakalaris? Yeah, that's me. Okay, and this is on an issue not coming before us tonight. If this issue comes, uh, to you tonight, okay, issue we want to save that for when we get to that issue. So, if your comments are regarding something that is on the agenda, we wait till that item comes up. Okay. All right. Excellent. Very good. So, if we have no other. No other comments? Slips. Uh, we will move on to uh, notices that on Tuesday, June 27th at 5 p.m., the Airport Commission Secretary duly posted the agenda on the bulletin board at Airport Administration. Uh, Commission Matters brings us to the minutes and the recommendation that we waive the reading of the minutes. Do I have a motion? Make a motion. We'll waive the reading and approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion passes, the minutes, reading of the minutes is waived, and that brings us to the subject of number item four, the ground transportation. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Hazel Johns, airport director, is traveling today for airline meetings, so I'm sitting in for her. And it's my pleasure to introduce Tracy Lincoln, who will be giving a presentation about the airport's new ground transportation system. So without further ado, Mr. Lincoln. All righty, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, That's number one. Is that the number one slide? Okay. So we're going to start with a, a presentation regarding the newly proposed ground transportation system this evening. But uh, before I go into the PowerPoint slide, I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, some general background on this program. I mentioned it in the subcommittee meeting, but I uh, I do want to mention it again. Currently, as we speak, um, we have been operating with only um, taxi cabs that provide on-demand service as uh, being permitted. On-demand service is are the taxi cabs that are allowed to um, sit alongside the curb in a designated area all day, um, each day at, at the airport. That when we refer to on-demand service, that's what we're referring to. People who are able to stage at the airport all day, they have permit that allows them to do that. Um, currently, they, were the they are the only ones permitted. Uh, airports throughout the country charge all types of transportation, as we will in the new program. Uh, we have existing ordinance that for many years have uh, required us to issue permits and charge fees. Uh, previous to the new terminal, we did not have the curb space to do that, and we tried to usher people into the short-term lot to collect what we could but the traffic people would allow them to operate um, when there was space. Uh, when after the new terminal opened, we began drafting a new program, and um, as we worked with the city attorney and city administrator to determine what the cab policy was going to be, whether we were going to use an RFP and get a single operator or a small consortium of operators, or whether we keep the cab system open. Um, during the kind of those ongoing discussions, uh, Uber and Lyft and what we refer to as transportation network carriers were created. Uh, they showed up at the airport, I want to say 2014, I believe was the first year they were here, and um, nothing's been the same since. It's one of the uh, main reasons that this is being brought back. It's, it's, it's overdue. We need to get better control of the roadway uh, with the transportation network carriers. They have so many different drivers with so many people using the roadway that it's really important that we uh, 
make sure that we get their charges levied and get people out there to monitor uh, the activities on the curb because we have other operators that also need some um, monitoring. So just kind of in a nutshell, we've had on-demand cabs for many, many years. The airport hasn't issued any new on-demand permits since 2001. We opened the system up in 2001 and we went from 15 cabs up to about, at one point, I want to say we had 25 or 26 cabs and then they started to drop off as uh, people weren't s pleased with the program or getting the revenue they thought and, um, and then it, it whittled down to about 18 cabs and that's where we've been for many years and we're down to 16 or 17 now as we speak. So just kind of in general for the throughout several years only on-demand cabs have been permitted and everybody else has been operating at no cost. So with that I will uh, discuss the new program that is pretty standard for what you find at other airports where we have fees for all of the operators and permit requirements for all the operators. We've done our very best to design a program that keeps the cost to the operators as low as we can while recovering the program cost. And um, in future years, if when they see how the, the revenues and expenses are balancing out, they'll be able to adjust those fees so that we can, again, because the fees are all passed on to the passengers, to the customers, so we want to make sure we keep that as low as possible. So that's been a goal of the program. And with that kind of long-winded introduction, I'll... Uh, I'll get started and discuss, uh, go to the PowerPoint and discuss a little bit about the ground transportation program. That, I don't think that's the first program. Can you go back to slide number one? Okay. Um, the new program is designed to fix current issues and incentivize on-demand permits. Uh, and the reason we say that is because the on-demand permits have a different fee structure that makes them um, less expensive, but there are some additional equipment and performance obligations that come with an on-demand permit. We'll discuss those later. Uh, all operators will be required to have a permit and pay fees. Um, we will require that they have all their current uh, state and city permits. The new program will include uh, new technology operators that I've already mentioned, Uber and Lyft, they're referred to as transportation network carriers and uh, during the development of the program or the most recent development I held six uh, stakeholder meetings with taxi cab industry and then the other folks meaning courtesy vehicle operators limos and um, shuttle drivers and the transportation network carriers all participated in meetings reviewed proposed fees and and regs and procedures have a lot of input. Overall consensus is uh, they're not thrilled. They believe they can live with it. Uh, Uber and Lyft would really prefer to see the cost at two, 250 rather than 275, what I'm proposing. But we'll, uh, we'll discuss that a little more as we get to those slides. So uh, anyway, regarding the transportation goals of the program, we're going to improve the transportation experience out of Santa Barbara significantly. We'll make sure that all our operators are in compliance with local regs. We're going to improve the operational control of airport ground transportation because currently we don't have any hard data. And so we'll, with the systems we're putting in, we'll know how many trips each operator is making, how many pickups. We'll know where they are on the curb. So we'll be able to really assign parking locations and deal with staffing and understand the intensity of the road use and then generate airport revenue to cover the cost of the program is an important goal of the program. Key elements of the new system, the airport vehicle, an AVI referred to as airport vehicle identification system, that's what we will use for all of the ground transportation carriers that are not um, transportation network carriers. If you're not an Uber, Lyft, Wings, Sidecar, one of those mobile app providers, then you will be required to buy a transponder for each vehicle that's going to serve this airport. Uh, we, the AVI will identify them as they, as they enter the commercial loop roadway and as they exit the commercial loop roadway. That way we know when trips are made, how long they were at the curb, when they arrived, when they exited, and you program into the system 
the fee for each trip for each type of operator so it produces monthly summaries for you it's, it's very efficient it's been used for many years at most airports in the country they're very well road tested did you say that was excluding the people like uber and lyft for the transponder correct yeah they, they don't do transponders we have a different way to track them okay okay um, one important note in the stakeholder meetings the shuttles and limousines that more frequently serve other airports uh, brought up the concern about the number of transponders they're getting and requested that we do our best to work with the vendor to see if our readers can read the same transponders they use at other airports. We've discussed that with the vendor uh, we believe we'll be using and they said that's not a problem. So we'll be able to accommodate those operators and I've discussed that with them at the last meeting and they were pleased. So that's what an automatic vehicle identification system is. Um, it, regarding real-time alerts, the what we refer to as the ground transportation officer who will be working the curb, kind of overseeing the activities on that curb, that person will have access to see what's going on in that system, live access when they sign into their computer. So they'll be able to see who's coming and going. So that'll be very handy. We have um, per trip fees for all pre-arranged operators, as I mentioned, and we will use a mobile application that works just like the transponders work for the transportation network carriers. It's also become standard over the last couple of years. It was developed by the staff of San Francisco Airport. Who else, right? It's been uh, well road tested and it's now available through AAAE. And um, both Uber and Lyft are aware that we want to use it. There was a significant um, pushback initially when we first talked to them. And they've since um, kind of dropped those objections and they're willing to make the investment that's necessary to have their pings talk to our pings, the mobile apps talk to each other. Um, so that is how we will accomplish knowing how many trips by each TNC, when they were here, how long they were here, all that. Next one. Okay, the types of permits that were issued. So that's in general um, how we're gonna track them and the key elements of the system. The, all the commercial operators, um, which are either a bus, a limousine, a transportation network company, they are prearranged service. So if you, s the commercial operators will all get prearranged uh, per permits that allow prearranged service. Courtesy operators will get a courtesy operator permit, but that's also prearranged service. But we just like to categorize them so we know who's typically directly charging the customer for the ride versus a courtesy operator who's working for a hotel or a motel or an off airport parking lot and they're giving the passenger a ride but the passenger's not paying them directly. But they still pay to use the rope and to use the loop road and do the pickup. But we like to know how many courtesy operators we have versus commercial operators that are directly receiving compensation from the passengers. Taxi cab operators, I believe everybody knows what a uh, taxi cab operator is. We have two types of taxi cab operators, prearranged and on demand. The on-demand taxi cab is a much more um, cumbersome permit with significant equipment and procedure requirements. Courier operators, we currently don't have any at the airport. There was some when we initially started, dropped out. We left it in in case, because uh, they come and go. So it is people that come and go and typically are picking up freight, light freight, on an airline or other for hire. Okay. As far as prearranged vehicle fees, prearranged vehicle fees are for all of the commercial and TNC and courtesy and um, courier operators. So everything except an on demand cab. Everybody except an on demand cab will pay the prearranged trip fees. And, pardon me? Yes, to pick up. And um, you can see based on the size of the vehicle, the vast majority of the vehicles are below 10 passengers. There's a couple of 10 to 24 passengers out here that are used on occasion by um, one, ho one or two hotels, but that's it. We currently don't have any of the larger vehicles serving on a regular basis, but we wanted to account for them. And the annual agreement for a prearranged operator is $120. And that's uh, it's paid up front. 
If they want a short-term 30-day agreement for a prearranged operator, they can do that. We will allow that for the prearranged operators. So if a limo company um, just, you know, wants to come up and be a prearranged operator for three months, test the waters out, they can, they get cheaper to buy a whole month, a whole year, but they could do that. They can test the waters out. And the uh, transponder, they will all be required to purchase the transponder, and it's estimated 40 or $50. Our system, um, the people we buy the system from will provide transponders for us. We can, uh, we will purchase those with the system and then be able to uh, sell it to the operators. Go ahead. Uh, it says here the business operating agreement is annual per company. Is Uber considered one company, Lyft considered one company? Yes. Thank you. Yes. But remember, each vehicle pays per trip fees. So all of on-demand, whether it's a courier, a courtesy vehicle, or a shuttle, or a limousine, all pay per trip with one um, $120, annual, uh, $120 annual agreement, it's 10 bucks a month. The on-demand vehicle fees, um, an operating agreement for an on-demand cab company will be a uh, a thousand dollars per vehicle per year and we had um, there's no per trip fees no deposit uh, not we do not have 30-day agreements available for them and they indeed will still have to get a transponder because although we're not charging them per trip we want to know in hard solid data rather than just um, companies filling out the form we want them to get those transponders so we know when trips are being made and how many and how long because n knowing the dwell time how long they sit there before they get a pickup is very important to us it really helps us manage that curve and so we want to make sure we're getting um, good accurate information so that will be required for on demand even though they're not going to pay a per trip fee we want to track those trips go ahead what is the current charge for the on-demand? How much do they current uh, does the cab currently pay for the? They ride? currently pay. They pay nine hundred dollars per year per vehicle. The way the fee is structured, it's a hundred and fifty dollars a month, and they have the right to operate two vehicles for a hundred and fifty dollars a month. So it's one hundred and fifty dollars a month. It's you know eighteen hundred a year. And that gives them the right to operate two vehicles. So in essence, it's 900 a year per vehicle, and we're proposing 1,000 a year per vehicle. So it's just gone up $100 a year per vehicle. Okay. And, uh, clarify for me. So you've made a statement that an, uh, a taxi could be an on-demand or a pre-arranged. Is, is really the difference there, the, the on-demand or the ones that just wait? out there at the curb, whereas somebody could prearrange with X cab company to be there waiting for that's them. Yes, that's and correct. And that would then fall under the prearranged. Yes, that's um, correct. On okay. demand, that's exactly right. They're sitting in the line. You just walk up, get in the cab and go. If you're calling up on a phone to ask a cab to come pick you up, that's prearranged. Okay, thank you. Another question, do we have in the terminal any type of facility for people to call courtesy companies or cabs? No, we do not. Okay, we did have in the previous terminal. No, I mean, that's okay. Not, not we important. did. We haven't had one in a lot of years. It, it stopped working a while before the construction. Okay, but there are no phones for cabs. Cabs are only obtained by either you using your personal phone or a public phone, if, thing, if such still exists, or going out to the curb to the on-demand line? We do have a phone available, but we don't have a phone dedicated to where you pick it up and it rings in a taxi cab. We don't have the old courtesy board type of phone that I think you're describing, where you press the button for the hotel or press the button for the cab, pick it up, it rings them, and you say, come get me. Yeah, okay. it's not in there. So um, just regarding the estimated um, revenue for pickups just to give you a quick picture we estimate 5,000 pickups monthly from prearranged um, all the prearranged combined that's limos shuttles cabs ubers lifts all of them combined on-demand operator permits we expect we have 13 well I think 
Mm. I expect a couple to drop out with some of these requirements, so I'm guessing we end up with 13. It might be more. It's an open system, but that's. And then miscellaneous um, trip charges and short term permits that are so, we just estimate 2,000 a year. So it's about 180 a year estimated revenue out of the system. And the cost of the system be about about 162 a year, 163. We're looking at someone on the staff, uh, someone staffing the curb from about 8 in the morning till midnight, $25 an hour. That includes benefits and estimated <coughs> salary. We're looking at having the contract parking lot management company that we end up with doing it. The company we have now has done it at other airports. And when we do a request for proposal to get uh, a competitive process on that, that will be included in the proposal, in the requirements. And um, so anyway, what we've got is our staffing cost. Then you've got an ABI system that's going to be an uh, annual maintenance and support agreement cost with the uh, billing fees combined. I figure those are about 17 grand a year. And so estimated first year cost of about 162.6. It leaves some slush in there in case we're short on pickups or other issues arise. They'll be able to look at this program and adjust fees in the future. So um, we want to make sure we leave a, we have a program that will run, not be in the red. Uh, the initial one-time purchase and install cost was approved in the FY18 budget. It will be adopted by council, well, it was two days ago, June 27th. And you saw it as part of our capital program, the ABI system estimated at 85000 Okay, so your uh, seventeen thousand a year is just maintenance on the ABI system itself. What is the expected life of that system? It's it's not just maintenance. It's also <coughs> some money I expect to pay for the billing for ABI. The, uh, excuse me, the transportation network carriers, the mobile application that tracks them will also cost an annual amount. Those two amounts combined have come up to about 17000 is my estimate. Okay, so the, the equipment, the $85,000 uh, for, for that equipment, what basically, you know, what would you depreciate that against? Is, or what's your life expectancy on it? Five years? Yeah. Yeah, five years they'll have something much newer and greater, I'm okay. sure. Okay. But that's not factored into your costs the way you no, it's calculate a, capital. Yeah, it's expense. just a one-time yeah. capital expenditure to, to get the thing going. How, however, that's 17000 a year, and if you add that to your 162, you're at 179, which comes very close to your 180. So mm -hmm. that sounds reasonable. Yeah, well, the, the 145 and the 17 combined come up to the 162. And so if we use, if indeed there is extra and we're able to stash that away, then we can redo the system in five years and have that money available. Right. I was saying the, the 85000 divided by your five years, if I did the math right, my head is 17000 oh, yeah, happens yeah, 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 to be yeah, 17000 which happens to mean that 180 covers your expenses plus okay. the acquisition of replacement equipment. Mm -hmm. I'm with you now. Thank you. Right. That is, it's a cost of the program. Yeah. 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 Okay. So real quick, what I'm going to do is um, you now know how we plan on charging fees and what we're going to use to track the fees and that it's a uh, monthly billing. Um, there's many more requirements for an on-demand <coughs> permit. And most of the concerns registered at the stakeholder groups had to do with on-demand uh, conditions of permit and proposed procedure requirements for the curb. So um, I was going to say those to last. I'll go through the prearranged. And if you have any questions, we'll talk about the prearranged requirements are very short. And then we'll go into the, what the on-demand uh, requirements are that have been um, the cause of some concern from the uh, taxi cab operators. So, whoa, I didn't go over that slide. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, so all of the permits, but specifically for the prearranged, you have to have current city taxi permit in good standing. 
you'll have to comply with all the airport rules and procedures, both your drivers and your company, meaning you, the company has to remit the fees on time, drivers need to behave when they get here. Um, uh, remit fees by due dates established in the operating agreement. Um, they have to agree to install the transponder at the owner's expense. And um, if it's a TNC, they'll, you know, they have to agree to program their app, which they will or they won't be allowed to serve. Um, and then they'll be required to provide monthly trip reporting. Even though we're counting trips, there's a requirement that they provide us a monthly trip so we can look at the two and balance them. Excuse so going back to that first item, uh, that means all of the Uber and Lyft vehicles have to have a city taxi permit? No, no. We're talking company permits. Okay. If, if the city issues a permit for the company's activity, then that company's city permit has to be current. Thank you. So again, I'm just going to highlight at the annual operating agreement, 120 a year per trip fee, 275 a trip with um, no deposit, and we will list them on the web page as being allowed to pick up. Um, so transportation network companies, uh, again, they're they're going to be tracked just like the other vehicles are within AVI. We're using an app tracking system. It uses what's called a geofence. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. It will provide us automatic billing and uh, trip reports so that we're able to, you know, balance everything out from what we count versus the report, uh, what the reports that we get from the operators. It's also uh, quickly becoming the standard for the airport because the average um, TNC employee is a very short-term employee and so we have lots of different operators that come and go and it's not realistic. There's no operator that has them using an ABI system. They'd be taking transponders on and off. This is very accurate and, and very mobile and works quite well and provides all the same functions. So, um, this, uh, so anyway, any new TNCs are automatically going to be um, programmed into our app once we get it up and running. Yeah, this is what I was looking for the geofence. So, there'll be a, um, a picture that they'll be that TNC operators will be able to see and they'll know that in order to be available for a ride they need to be outside a certain geofence area we may create a small area that we want them to be in or near the challenge here just so everybody can picture this is um, we offer on-demand service that allows people to sit on the airport and wait. And we do not want limos, shuttles, TNCs, or anybody else just circling the airport waiting for a call from somebody so they can be here in 25 seconds or 35 seconds. Nor do we want to encourage constantly looping around. So we'll pull the geofence out further so it's at least, you know, over a mile away and nobody within um, that will be able to be within that geofence area will be able to be shown as available because at that point they're starting to bump up against an on-demand operator to where they're just right there on airport. So we work with the operators, we establish the geofence, um, they know where the geofence is and their app tells them you know when they're in it as well as it does us. So just wanted to give you kind of a picture of what it looks like in the person working the curb will have the ability to bring up that visual at any time and see which TNCs are roaming outside that area and or inside that area. And when they come in the area, you know, they get flagged. So it's a very, it's a very interesting system. So that would include both of the cell phone lots, the geofence, so that they couldn't go hang out in the, either the cell phone lots? Yes. Does it affect the, um general aviation, the FBO? No, this is for service to the terminal. Okay. 
But I can tell you that if they were over at an FBO, they would not be eligible to pick up at the terminal right then because then they're, they're on airport. So. Are there any standards at other airports for the size of a geofence to exclude them from a terminal area? I did not look into that. I, do, I don't know. It's so dependent on kind of geographics, just trying to get them outside that property line. <coughs> I do know that some have just directed them to a certain area, and we're talking about doing that as well because we have the drive-in theater way over there. It's over a mile from the terminal, and so we may use that. Yeah, I guess I, I fail to see. As, as I, I understand supporting our are very committed on-demand operators, but it doesn't necessarily serve the public interest to keep them away. Uh, but I we're not trying to keep them away. <laughs> well, it it might seem that way, <laughs> as opposed to having them parked over in the cell phone lot, for instance. Okay. Well, would it but be practical to stage Uber in long-term parking off of Hollister? That's what we're looking at. Yeah, that's the lot I was referring to. Okay, so so that would be outside the geofence. We customize the geofence to be where we need it to be, so we would make that outside the geofence. Yeah, I'd like to suggest to somebody who uses the cell phone parking lot that late at night it can get fairly full. So I, w I would suggest that not having TNCs waiting in that area would be a good idea because it kind of excludes the legitimate, I'm picking up my brother, I need to wait in a place. We've already put signs up there and uh, have issued citations. Now we will discuss the on-demand operators. Do you have any other questions about pre-arranged operators? At the end, I'll kind of do a summary where we talk about both. There are, um, there may be questions, so I'll go on with the uh, on-demand operators then. I believe I already mentioned $1,000 a year per car. Currently it's $900. Um, during the subcommittee meeting and the information given to the on-demand operators previous to that was that they would be required to pay the annual fee in full up front, no prorating and no refunds. Um, the drivers felt that that was excessive and an additional financial burden. Uh, the subcommittee asked if we could uh, consider some upfront money so they still kind of had some skin in the game and uh, we're you know, committed to doing a good job, but maybe not as much so. We're looking at quarterly now. So they'll, uh, when you sign on for the obligation for an annual permit, you will be required to pay those quarterly fees in advance, Thanks. quarterly at a time. Thanks. So, and it was the whole year at a time during the subcommittee presentation, so that has changed. But Just it's still for a full year, non, if non proratable. Yes. Just build in quarterly increments. Yes. That's what they asked for. So someone can't yeah. decide I want to work three quarters this year and pay for the quarter only as it comes. They take the summer quarter off. They come back in the fall. and No, they cannot do that. It's all year. There's no backing out. Okay. Uh, the on-demand operators, as I mentioned, we're going to use uh, the ABI system to track them where uh, they will buy the transponders. The cabs out here now don't have transponders, so they will need to purchase those. And it will be, uh, we estimate 40 or 50 bucks each, and they'll need to put one on each vehicle. And, the, uh, and I mentioned we'll get real-time alerts. It really helps with our curbside management. And during a transition period, we could do manual logging of trips for all operators if we needed to, if there was a hang-up on system installation and we needed to get started. In a previous life, I had an airport that was busier on the curb than we are right now, and we did it manual for a couple of years. Um, but it's a job. I'd prefer not to have to do that, but it, it certainly is doable in a pinch should it come to that. 
Can you explain what is a real-time alert that tells you how many vehicles are Just there? Just that somebody's or? entered the, uh, the alert will be that somebody's entered the, the reader on the ah. commercial or exited the reader. That's okay. what it is. So that gives you tally counts yeah. or something? Yeah, so you'll know how many have ex entered in the last certain amount of time that you searched for versus exited. You should be able to see who's actively at the curb. Um, some of the changes that were made to the on-demand requirement after the last subcommittee meeting in response to driver requests. The drivers were upset. I had a $60 annual uh, driver agreement that they were going to sign, that they were going to be required to sign. And as um, a result of that, they would get an on-demand taxi ID issued by the airport. They felt that was burdensome and that um, it was just m not necessary. So in discussions with staff and what have you, we eliminated that requirement. And we do want them to have a name tag that says the taxi company name and the driver name. I don't believe that's um, unreasonable. And we think it's important that if you know they're out of their vehicle, that they have a name tag. It's important in their vehicle. We think it's good professional appearance. So anyway, that's been changed. I rem um, it saves them $60 a year. And we revise the annual permit fee to quarterly. So those are kind of the biggest changes since the meeting that benefit on-demand drivers. They, instead of paying full in front, they'll do quarterly up front. And uh, no $60 a year annual agreement, no requirement to wear an airport-issued cab driver ID. Some of the permit requirements for an on-demand ID are current city taxi permit in good standing. This, for the record, the city issues um, taxi driver permits and taxi cab company permits, and they inspect all the vehicles. So each cab company, well, actually all cab companies, whether they're prearranged or on-demand, all have to be in good standing with city permits. But now we're <coughs> talking about on-demand, so I just want to point out that we, uh, we check on the city permits, make sure they're in good standing. Uh, the director has the right to limit the number of permits issued should we get, uh, should it become hard to handle. I, I'm not sure that's gonna happen. It used to be I got lots and lots of calls constantly for on-demand uh, cab permit requests and I, I haven't gotten one in a couple of years. Uh, their dress code is much uh, stricter than the prearranged. The prearranged, gotta remember, those you're calling those people and you're telling them come in and get me and all we do is make sure they have current insurance and current permits make sure they know where to park and that they agree to dress reasonably well and professional and they can come behave get their people with the on-demand they're here all day and we want to be the doorway not the doormat and so we're trying to raise the bar a little bit to improve the appearance of the taxi line uh, with both um, vehicles, drivers, just the overall. We'll have uh, a uniformed ground transportation officer out there to assist all passengers and drivers from all operators. And we want the drivers to have a, a tighter dress code. So it's neat, clean appearance at all times. Shirts with collars are required. No shorts, no sandals, no flip-flops. Closed-toed shoes are required. No logo baseball type hats. No cowboy or western style hats. So I recall several years ago when we, I think, first visited this program, um, there were certainly some comments made about the requirement for pants and no shorts. Um, and certainly this is Santa Barbara. There are even some finer hotels that have valets that wear shorts. Uh, was that brought up this time when the, in these meetings? No. OK. Thank you. Overall, they don't like anything about the dress code. <laughs> I don't want to misrepresent that. So it was just a broad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, uh, what I was able to gather in speaking with them is that they believe that for the most part, most of the time, other than shorts and sandals, uh, they believe that they're um, in relative reasonable compliance with those. Okay. 
So it's continuing. Um, we have airport reserves the right to implement the taxi starter. I want to emphasize the point that you've heard me talk a lot about the person working the curb. It's ground transportation officer. That person <coughs> helps our, the passengers and drivers from all types of vehicles. It is not a person that's dedicated to the cabs. I can tell you a lot of the person's time will be spent on cabs, but they are not a person that's dedicated to cabs. We don't have any intention of immediately hiring a cab starter to dedicate to the cabs. This has been an existing rule since 2001, actually since 1995, and we've not implemented it yet. But we're hanging on to it in case we need to, but we don't plan to. Um, this is a big change. The next one is no vehicle older than 10 calendar years upon the signing of the agreement. Uh, the cab drivers do not like this. They want it changed. They believe that if the vehicle passes um, the safety inspections and it is in good condition, meaning it doesn't have, the, it meets the condition requirements, it doesn't have the dents, dings, scratches, then they believe it should be allowed. They think the 10 years is kind of a an arbitrary number and it it serves no real purpose at the airport we we believe that um, having a fleet of newer cab vehicles available is beneficial uh, we know they all meet the the safety requirements but we do want to try and raise the bar a little bit and so we stuck with the uh, 10 calendar year when we first started talking to them it was eight and they wanted 12 and we ended up with 10 but I, I do want to let you know that they don't like it there's nobody likes it as, um, as far as on-demand taxi cab operators um, also they must agree to participate in pilot service programs if we implement them we don't have any plans to implement any right now, but just so that you're not wondering specifically what I'm referring to is uh, the bigger issue we've had is night service. It hasn't been a problem in a while, but in the past on a couple of occasions, we've had all the on-demand cabs go home before the last flight, especially if the last flight is delayed and you have people come out and there's no cab service. And if their phone battery is dead or if they belong to the jitterbug demographic, they might not be comfortable looking for an Uber or a Lyft or another mode. So we like to have the on-demand cabs available. Um, again, we're not going to jump out with this, but I've discussed it with all of them. They did not voice big concerns about this. The other p service program we have right now is the minimum fare, and we plan on keeping that. So currently, I believe most of you know that if you hop into a cab and ask them to run you down to 7-Eleven in Old Town, you're going to pay $15. That's, uh, that's kind of like the max short haul fare they're allowed to uh, charge would be $15, the, the short haul fare. And we plan on keeping that. And that is, um, that was implemented as kind of an acknowledgement that many times an on-demand cab will sit for three, three and a half, four hours before they get a ride. And then the only ride they get is to 7-Eleven, and they're not allowed to turn down rides. So that's why that minimum fare exists. We've had it um, since 2001. Uh, must install at owner's expense in each airport permitted taxi vehicle, radio communication equipment as specified by the airport. And that is specifically to call people up from staging because oh, we plan on having about five vehicles out in front of the terminal so once a cab or two pulls away, then the ground transportation officer will get on the radio, call on-demand cabs that are, will be in the staging area, and bring them up to the back of the line in front of the terminal where they can wait with the others that are in the terminal area. So, so you stated currently there's maybe 13 operators. I know I've seen on occasion maybe eight or ten, maybe more. There's cars nine companies, out there. and um, I th believe right now we have maybe 16 vehicles. So, do we have a situation where that curb is congested with taxis so that you need to get them off in a waiting area? Yeah, we need more room for all the prearranged operators. We don't. We don't really have a need to have 
16 taxi cabs taking up the entire curb when we can make more room for shuttles and TNCs and make it a, a safer operation. We don't have, we don't drop off 100 people and have 20 come out and want to get in a cab all at once. Right. Okay. So well, we can I'm, get I'm cabs up so that passengers won't have to wait. Okay. The key is no passenger waiting time. We want the passenger to come up. If they want an on-demand cab, it's there, they're gone. So are you anticipating requiring them to install radios yes. initially? So yes, except it'll probably be a handheld. It won't have to be a bolt-in one that okay. way. If they want to use it from different cars, they can. And does the airport currently have radios as well? Or will that be an acquisition for the airport? We'll talk to the contract company that we get for it. They typically have radios parking management companies that they speak to employees with and we'll see what kind of communications equipment they want we're going to do our very best to keep it as low as possible but Sometimes that will be a program cost yes absolutely so you have an estimate of how much these types of radios cost and how long they live and how long you'll how many you'll have I'm just trying to get a, a an idea of kind of the overall cost of this program um, in terms of you know really what's going into it in terms of airport costs I know there's a lot of value I don't think anybody questions that but uh, just getting a, an overall idea so now we've got we've got radios that need to be acquired yeah we'll, we'll only need to purchase a radio uh, well, you'll need two if you got one you'll need two and, at least uh, yeah <laughs> we can pick up an inexpensive handheld radio for a couple hundred bucks and we may end up using push to talk cells is the route that it may go which is also um pretty doable so do they still exist the next tells or something oh yeah they absolutely <laughs> do okay. yeah. yeah they're pretty big in the public service public safety I, I, well i was going to suggest along that line that seems to me like radio to communicate short distances like that is sort of last century uh, I would think that with cell phones and, and apps, you sh should be able to come up with a way for the, uh, the, the person out there to summon more cabs without having to have a dozen or, or more radios out there. Something to at least consider. We will definitely look into it, but with the other airports that I spoke with, when they're calling cabs up, they're almost always on a radio. It's, and maybe that's because they've been in place for so long, so I'll look, but it's just, it's very quick. It gives them the ability to kind of have a conversation with the cab driver if you need two or three or what have you. So I, I'm sure there's new ways and we'll look into those. But the intent was a two-way radio, just. Um, and then they need <coughs> to accept credit cards without fees for use of credit cards will be another condition. There's a lot of them, That's and I listed all of them because this is what seemed to cause most of the controversy. And um, this is part of the reason that we changed the fee structure for on-demand cabs. We believe it's a value to have on-demand cabs here and available for the public, but we want to raise uh, the bar on the appearance of the cab. And we also want to make sure that um, we can get cabs up from staging fast and uh, kind of get people in and out in a very dependable way. So we will um, continue here. There's a lot of them. So we've already gone over the installation of the transponder and the cabs will need to get that. They're still going to need to be required to submit a trip report, even though they're not paying per trip for reasons I've already stated. And uh, they are going to need to complete any training that we designate as required. I can tell you right now the only training I would um, think would be required is about 30 minutes of videos that they can view for free online having to do with customer service. In the past we've done ADA com uh, training to teach them some of the uh, kind of preferred and correct ways to help and assist uh, physically challenged individuals so we we may require that again if we can get a good course and we typically provide those at no cost but we just want them to get that training 
Can, can you uh, explain what's involved with a trip report? Is that something beyond what your AVI system? No, always? just the date and the time. I you know, made a trip, picked up one person on such and such a date, such and such a time, just that date, this many pickups and times. So the operators are going to be required to start logging that and then submitting? They're actually already required that. according to the city, according to the permit requirements as far as they're supposed to keep records on pickups. We haven't required that they turn them in. So you will be requiring them to turn those in? Yes. yes. And then you'll be doing something with those reports? Well, with the um, on-demand operators, we will just use that so we have that for operational data on the road. It'll let us know how long an on-demand operator is sitting before they get a ride on an average. It'll let us know about typically how long um, the number of rides of each. And at some point, we'll be able to talk to the operators and get an idea of how far they're going. So a lot of that has to do with from the time they leave until the time they return. Okay. Um, so when you sign for an on-demand permit, you need to be willing to drive to areas in Camarillo, San Ynez, Lompoc, Santa Maria, <coughs> approximately a 60 mile radius. So if they're not willing to do those trips, um, then we, it's a condition. If they were to turn down one of those trips, that would be a violation of their permit. Uh, none of the operators expressed any concern whatsoever about this, but it's important to put on there because, again, people need to know that there's certain things that they can kind of, and this is where the bulk of our passengers come from are these service areas, that's why it was chosen. Um, and again, you cannot turn down any request for transportation within the service area, including short hauls. I already mentioned we have the short haul fee and um, must post what we were going to call a passenger bill of rights within the plain view. And that just lets the passengers know of some of the things that they can expect, which you'll see here momentarily. Does the city uh, have an existing bill of rights or require no. such a No, all document? we're going to do is list bunches of the conditions of permit and procedures that we're requiring so that the passengers know what's required of the taxi cab so they know what to expect. Are you going to be providing them that document to post? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, on a, tw you know, a legal size laminated. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, it, it's, it's very like, small. Okay. It'll be like a bookmarker that like you used to get in elementary okay. school. Remember about that long, you know, be in an envelope you just pull out, okay. and look at it, and hopefully put back in because I don't want to continue to put thousands of them in caps. Um, Do you have an estimate for the cost to produce these? These cards? Yeah. Okay, it'll be minor. Okay. Yeah. I've probably thrown away more paper than I <laughs> used Well, they're going to have together. to be on cardstock and probably <laughs> laminated. And yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, service animals will be required to allow to ride in the passenger compartment of the vehicle with certain exceptions. So, and we'll deal with those exceptions as they come up. But, you know, there might not be a room for a horse in the vehicle. So we, we have to have some, you know, vehicle condition requirements, the exterior, you no know, dents, broken lights, cracked lenses, should appear clean, well-maintained. Um, basic stuff, mm, some of which are already in place and we will start um, enforcing much more closely. And these are the types of things that are on the Bill of Rights what we're going over right now. Everything will be on the Bill of Rights. It just lets all the passengers know. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, there you go. Told you it was coming. Um, so these are conditions of the permits, and these are what's going to be uh, on the Passenger Bill of Rights. It will change some of this as other things come up. But courtesy, greet and interact with passengers, provide passenger door and luggage assistance, provide climate control, air conditioning or heat at the request of the passenger, allow passenger choice of music, radio or other device, or silence if they are not in the mood for it. Provide direct transit to locations in the Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, Lompoc, San Inez, and Ventura service area based on street address or names of public facilities. Pretty common among cabs. Next. Uh, speak and understand the English language. 
uh, maintain proper dress and appearance, including company ID name tag with driver and company name on it. And then uh, proper dress shall include, and we mentioned some of the things I've already read, but this is last at the subcommittee meeting, everybody wanted to know what was going to be on the Bill of Rights, so this is it. Next. And um, so professional conduct towards pretty much everybody out there. Not solicit or offer funds or gifts to attain additional trips or specific benefits from passenger or ground transportation officer. Not refuse undesired fares, including short fares, and post in the cab within easy reach. Respond immediately to lost and found and complaint communications, and accept credit cards or cash for payment of fares without credit card fees or minimum credit purchase amount. So that's initially what we intend to have on the Passenger Bill of Rights. It gives them an idea of what to expect. Uh, I'm working from a copy of the, the uh, program rules and regulations from a couple weeks ago, but I don't find a mention of the Bill of Rights, this Bill of Rights requirement. In there? Is that no, is it that's a condition of permit, and it's it says in there that the airport has the ability to create conditions of permit as needed to make the program work. One of the key elements that make this program work is the flexibility we have to work with the operators to create new conditions of permit or eliminate other conditions of permit so we can make that road work. What we're going into next is procedures. Those are draft procedures that will probably be changed quite a bit within the first two months of the system. So where is the distinction between what it becomes one of the rules and regulations and what is a condition of permit? You know, we're being asked to approve the rules and regulations, as I understand it, but we, it seems that we have a whole body of essentially rules and regulations that are conditions of permit that uh, I don't know if we're going to, uh, will we be reviewing conditions of permit as well? Everything that you've revert, that you have re reviewed tonight is pretty much conditions of the permit. I didn't go over the regs a lot. A lot of them are also regs. I'm happy to go over that. All of the um, um, concern from the operators had to deal with the conditions. The permit requirements are um, similar to the conditions as far as, you know, you have, it, permits are just more general. I can, go, it was included in the handout, it's like you have to pay the fees on time, you have to pay the fees that are charged, mm -hmm. have proper permits, mm -hmm. follow instructions, adhere to the conditions of permit. Uh, the disciplinary procedures are very flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, they will be guidelines to where we will deal with verbal warnings with drivers and then provide notices to taxi cab companies so that we can talk to the companies and the drivers and avoid issuing violations as much as we can unless, you know, neither are working to cooperate. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, two or three warnings that are given out before a violation is typically issued. Okay. Well, it, it seems like this entire program is somewhat, uh, you know, a big body of what gives this program a character is ending up in the conditions of the permit. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious what process is anticipated for reviewing those conditions of permit to have, you know, public input or commission input or the input of the, um, the providers. This is the process. The stakeholder meetings that I've had, I reviewed all of, I reviewed the regs, the fees, and proposed conditions of permit. The pr procedures and the stuff that's included on the passenger bill of rights, it was it was just referred to as conditions of permit, and it was the the operators got it uh, probably four weeks ago, three four weeks ago. And before that, they've had all the regs, and we've discussed all the permit conditions. So a lot of them have been changed as a result of those meetings. Okay. Um, so is there a document that was shared that, I mean, I, what we see as a PowerPoint, is there a document with the conditions of permit? I think it's, that, um, isn't it the handout? Okay, mm -hmm. just the one, so not one that was published. The okay. rules and regs are one document. 
and then I've got the conditions of permit all listed on this document. Okay. Everything that's on here is on this document. And then the general disciplinary guidelines are not in this. I didn't have a specific slide to cover it, but it, it is in here and it's uh, verbal warnings where we review what's going on and talk to the drivers and talk to the operators and determine we everybody gets two verbal warnings as a guideline unless it's an egregious serious violation so we're doing uh, the kind of program is designed to be flexible so that we work with operators we're going to review costs annually and we want to get the procedures working for the operators well that's why I had um, kind of the number of meetings that we did we changed it a lot we changed uh, fee structures we had pre-arranged kind of limo, shuttle, and cab people saying that things should also be changed for on-demand cabs because they all saw the value to some on-demand cabs being available and kind of knew it was a dying industry. And although it's certainly not our job to save an industry, we do believe that there is benefit to on-demand cab service for our passengers because a lot of them are not cell savvy in mobile apps. Some of them are not mobile app savvy or cell savvy so um and just like cabs for a lot of other reasons some people don't want to drive an uber or a lyft or a ride mm -hmm. so Tracy, thank you um did you share that i missed it the percentage of um those that were not at the other meeting of what now is going to uber what used to be cabs on demand it's really important to know that figure i would say that um Probably 85% of the trips leaving this airport right now um, are from a TNC, an Uber, or a Lyft. And we're talking whether it's on demand or pre arranged, 85%. I mean, you still have courtesy vehicles coming in to pick people up, and there's people that don't use them and still use on demands. Our on demand cabs were getting about three rides a day. And then when the service got bumped the last couple of months, they're getting sometimes a little bit more four rides a day they they were very honest and open with me they told me that the additional flight did help them a little bit so uh, they've been very upfront with that and in the stakeholder meetings they've been very upfront with their dislike on some of the conditions of the permit it's like they've dealt with all the rules and regs and that's never really been their issue because of what they deal with on the curb is really kind of the conditions of the permit rules and regs are you have to have your permit you know you have to pay the fees on time just real but the conditions are kind of where the rubber meets the road and the procedures and the fees so that I kind of spent my time on fees and conditions of permit and we're about to uh, we're about to start curbside procedures so real quick on curbside procedures I expect these to change 60 days from the beginning not everyone will change but these are draft procedures and talking to some other folks that are managing curbs and haven't done it in the past that have been used to a great degree of success. You always start out more strict and then you can morph it and loosen it up where you're able to to keep control. But you've got to start out tight to get control because right now we've got an uncontrolled roadway out there. And, um, you know, we used to have someone out there monitoring more often, but our staff's been much thinner and we've had to spend much more time chasing away unattended vehicles from the private uh, terminal curbside. So the commercial curb has not been as well monitored. And we've got some TNC operators that are new that are trying to do the right thing, but they don't know where to go. Uh, we've got some cab operators that are very frustrated with TNCs. So um, kind of we've really worked with them to try and produce some procedures and get a person out there on the curb that can keep everybody um, on their best behavior and and doing well for the customers so regarding taxis on demand procedures for on demand taxis specifically is what we're talking about a driver uh, may ask the customer's destination only after he has accepted the fare a driver cannot decline the customer based on his or her destination to do so is considered a refusal of fare um, and I mentioned not not allowed to refuse short hauls, not allowed to refuse errors, so we're just clarifying procedures. You're obligated to provide 
courteous customer service, which includes greeting customers and assisting with luggage. If driver is talking on his cell phones, assume they will not be able to provide the greeting and luggage assistance. Mm -hmm. Customer will be assigned to the next cab. Excuse me. <coughs> so the fir I understand the, the desire to not have them refuse uh, a fare. You've got a, somebody who's been sitting out there for seven hours and 50 minutes, and someone comes up uh, on an eight-hour workday, and somebody comes up and says, yeah, I need a ride to Camarillo, and it's 5 o'clock. That's going to be an hour and a half if you're lucky to get down there and an hour and a half to get back. They can't just say, N no, I'm sorry, it's the end of my work day. I can't take you that far? No. No, they need to, if they need to have uh, drivers there that can meet the service, the s service area requirement while they're working at the airport. So if some driver is at the very end of a shift, the company can have another driver come out with another vehicle or what have you. But when they're in the line, they're required to accept the rides. Now, if they get a request for a ride way outside the service area, then it would be... No, but inside the service area could still be three hours. I, yeah. I, I wonder about the practicality of that just from some of the legalities of I, I don't know whether drivers are limited to the number of hours they're allowed to drive, the number of hours they're allowed to be at work, um, how the payment works with overtime, et cetera. But um, I, I can see where that would be a reasonable thing for a driver to do for a very long fare. Otherwise, they'd have to work a five-hour day because they'd never know when they'd get a three-hour ride after that. It's well, this is an existing obligation. They're not allowed to refuse fares now. Okay. And um, it's never been an issue. It's never come up. Okay. This um, seems to be all very thoroughly and well worked out, but how does it differ from the city of Santa Barbara? And are there other departments of the city that have their own um, ground transportation requirements? There are no other departments that have them, as far as I know. The city of Santa Barbara has a few different areas where they allow cabs to sit, but they just enter. They they do not have on-demand and pre-range. They just have taxi cab permits, and um, if they can find a spot and sit somewhere, like at the train station and what have you, they're they're allowed to sit in certain areas that are marked, and um, then they just depend on the drivers to uh, behave and or customers to report issues. They do not have an individual person in different areas monitoring it. Because of the length of time and number of drivers we have sitting in one area that's always been much more than anywhere else in the city, it is, um, it's really best to have somebody out there monitoring and managing it. So really we're providing queue space for the, the on-demand taxis. Yes. And, and that's the, the cost to us, uh, the airport, un unless we have somebody standing there to, to direct that traffic. Yeah. Well, we do plan on having a ground transportation yeah. officer out there on the curb each day, but they won't be dedicated to just the cabs. They're there to help drivers yeah. of all the transportation modes and answer questions of customers. But a lot of their time will be spent on cabs for sure. And so if I get off the airplane and, and collect my baggage and go out to get a cab, how will this change my experience it between last week and when this goes into effect? Well, I, what would happen is when you walk out there, there you see uh, a person in a uniform type setup, a ground transportation officer. If they weren't busy, you could go to them for assistance or they might greet you. But if you're a regular and you know where you go and you want to walk right to that first on-demand cab and grab it, you can do that. And, um, and, and that'll work just fine. And then that on-demand driver would just check in with the GTO and go. So the, the real improvement is going to be having a uniform person at the curb? Yep, they'll be able to answer questions in an uh, honest and unbiased fashion. They'll be able to make sure that we don't have uh, TNCs and shuttle drivers and cab drivers trying to give each other the short hauls, which is which goes on daily. It's one of the bigger problems out there is, uh, you know, it's people will try to ditch a short haul. Riders. 
yeah, <coughs> somebody talks to a taxi cab driver and wants to go to 7-Eleven and they're quick to mention that there's another way that could get in there much easier and less money and what have you. Or sometimes TNCs will um, try to avoid a ride and say there's an issue. So it's, it's not an isolated thing. It's best to have somebody out there monitoring and offering up some um, assistance on those issues. So the airport will be providing uniforms to the GTO? I'm sure they'll be wearing something, yes. And do you have an estimated <laughs> annual cost for No, we're going to uh, get with the contract uh, parking lot provider and we'll, I've got the $25 an hour be charged. If there's any other minimal charges having to do with uniforms or other costs, I'm sure that uh, slush in there will take care okay. of it. So you expect that to be provided by the mm -hmm. contract? Yeah, contract. yeah okay. we're looking at having this done on a contract basis. Okay. Uh, and drivers are expected to accept customer's decision, not question the customer's choice. They have the right to choose or decline any vehicle, company, or driver without reason. So if the first customer in line is not ready to leave and has not yet been assigned to a cab, the customer will be asked to step aside while the next customer in line is loaded. If the customer has been assigned to a taxi, the driver will have the option to wait for that customer or to take the next available customer unless the driver has already asked the customer's destination, which we went into on the first one. This is a problem we hope, and the on-demand cab drivers hope we have, because that means there's people lining up for a ride. That would be like the good old days. Some of these procedures are from when we had a little more cab activity, but we like to think it's still going to be there to some degree. Next, okay. Uh, again, now this may morph a little, but initially we really we're going to want the drivers to stay with their vehicles and um, only approach the GTO when they have a specific question. We don't want groups of drivers wandering over and hanging out near the GTO. It's it's caused problems in past situations where I've worked and when I talk to other airports on the phone, they just like, you know, everybody in their designated areas with uh, the ground transportation officer going to different areas and dealing with different um, employees and assisting customers. Once everybody starts congregating in a certain area, it's, it tends to unwind and when bad things happen. So anyway, drivers are required to follow directions of the uh, SBA staff which is the person on the curb or our traffic personnel. Drivers that do not follow directions may be subject to regulatory action. That's obvious because we're talking about conditions of permit and permits can be violated, but the reason I put that in there is because uh, taxi drivers also have permits from the city of Santa Barbara. In order to be a taxi cab driver, you get a, a permit from the city of Santa Barbara. And so if, um, if there is egregious violations and, you know, whether it's profanity or violence or it's just refusal, we, we have other avenues available other than just the company's permit. So um, put that on there just to make, bring that out. And, um, and then again, there's going to be a requirement to make sure the proper type of uh, car seat or infant seat is used. Um, so on item one there, you mentioned a booth. Will you be constructing a booth? We have a small wooden thing that we may paint to look better. We might get something, but right now we have something that we can use and label and we can set it out there. And that'll be aesthetically pleasing? We have Hopefully. something that we can set mm -hmm. out there. Okay. So does every cab, uh, on-demand cab, is, are they required to have car seats? For infant car seats, child no, car seats? No, no, no. The, okay. the, the, the parents okay. typically have those. And if a parent is stuck there with that one, I'm not going to require a cab driver to violate the law so that the parent can get someone. They, at that point, they can call family. Okay. Uh, interaction with ground transportation or other drivers um, needs to be reasonable. Drivers not. Pro Will you go back one slide? I missed something on the slide that's just not registering. Um, so drivers cannot legally transport, okay, cannot legally transport a small child or infant without the appropriate seat. Go ahead. Um, yes, 
this is just um, again getting back to the ground transportation officers not wanting them to congregate in, in one area and not having non fare related conversations among customers and um, really emphasizing to drivers they need to call the GTO out there when they've got disagreements with either another operator or another driver we want to know about it and we want the GTO involved in that so that they're there as a witness and we don't have finger pointing and he said and she said and they both get violations. We, we will start, we start out stricter and we'll morph these as uh, these procedures develop on the curb. So next. Again, I just, a couple of examples of, you know, what we consider bad violations that would result in some regulatory action. And um, I already mentioned the one about the booze, I guess I, unintentionally listed that twice but one important one is that a vehicle has to be able to have at least four passengers in order to be an on-demand cab because it's just not uncommon to have two three people hop in a cab so we want to make sure that we have at least four passengers I've not really ever seen a cab without it but we thought we'd list it so you say GTO booths are you anticipating multiple booths out there on the curb? It's a typo. Oh, okay. Single booth. Booth. Okay. Maybe someday two booths. So, um, again, I mentioned we intend to have five cabs initially. And, um, you know, we'll fill from the top spot and fill in through the back. And so, as one goes out, the others will move up. And we'll make sure that we move them forward so nobody tries to cut line gaps. And uh, this last one where it says drivers parked in the loading area must remain with their vehicle at all times. Because business has dropped and it can really be a long time, the cab drivers said that, especially on hot days, they feel that's a very difficult requirement. The subcommittee asked that we try to find maybe a place where they could sit so um, that will be modified so that they are either remain with their vehicle or in a designated area and what we'll do is we'll either I don't know if we'll do the passenger shelter or because there is one a little further east right as you enter the commercial loop road there's two passenger shelters so we may be able to allow them to be in that area or um, we may be able to put an umbrella out or some shade structure, but we'll modify that so it is with vehicle or in designated driver area. Where are they standing now? Where are they staying now when they're not with their vehicle? Uh, well, right now they're in violation of the rules, but they go, I believe, into the historic terminal or sometimes a bench in front of the historic terminal. We've had lawn chairs and planners, and we've had... Um, people wandering through drivers wandering through the parking lots we've had passengers call up concerned about people wandering through parking lots and end up being a taxi cab driver so it, I mean when you sit here and you listen it seems so overly burdensome but these all exist for a reason problems or issues that have existed here in the past or are, are very common at other airports among cab drivers because when you're sitting for hours and hours things start to happen as you get bored um, next one. Okay, so uh, drivers on a cell phone will not be assigned to fare until they're ready to receive passengers. I believe I mentioned that already. Drivers picking up prearranged passengers must park in the designated parking spots and cannot be in the line for on-demand service. This is an important distinction that I wanted to bring up. When you buy an on-demand permit, you will be allowed to perform prearranged service, but when you perform prearranged service, you will have to pay a prearranged per trip fee. So if you're sitting in the on-demand cab line and you get a call from a longtime customer who just arrived at the airport and they're walking out, maybe you're over at the staging area, you're not in the terminal area, or maybe you're the number five cab in the one through five. So what you would do at that point is you'd let the GTO know, hey, I just got a prearranged call. I'm pulling out of the line. They're, as soon as they pull up, I'll pull out of line. I'll pull into the prearranged area. They're letting that GTO know. So that GTO can log that down as a prearranged trip and that driver can note that on their monthly trip report that that was a prearranged trip that they would need to pay a prearranged trip fee for. 
And so that way, they still have the ability to provide that service, but they'll pay that fee when they provide that service. And um, yeah, and all, all those pretty much deal with what I just said. We want to make sure the driver and the, uh, and the ground transportation officer are talking and that the trip properly gets logged. So if I walk out of the airport and there are five cabs sitting there, I have to take the first one? Nope. I can just walk up to number five because he's the guy who always takes me? Yep. So that's still an on-demand, not a, um, a, a prearranged? Correct. Is there some way for a passenger to know that? Let's just say a woman, it's late at night, and she would rather ride, let's say, with a woman driver, and there happens to be a woman driver in cab number four. The ground transportation officer will tell them that. Theoretically, any cab driver would also tell them that. But with that third party, that objective person who will work for us on the curb, then we're more certain that they'll get that information. We can also work on some additional signage that mentions that as well. Yeah. Not obligated to take the first cab in line. So it's one thing I haven't discussed because it's not been brought up. But we'll, when we start off, we'll put some additional signage out there for visibility purposes so that the passengers, it's easier for them to discern. It makes it easier for the GTO. It makes it easier for the drivers when we, we have better signage out there. So um, drivers may not offer or recommend alternative transportation. If a customer refuses to pay the minimum fare, driver will inform the GTO and re requested a new passenger be assigned to him. And the GTO can discuss that with the passenger. I know that's the minimum. Um, they can always opt to go, leave, and walk away and do a prearranged <coughs> transportation if they'd like. Uh, taxi drivers may not discuss shuttle pricing with customers or make recommendations regarding shuttles. This used to be the most common complaint I had. It was just rampant. Um, hasn't happened in a while because now the on-demand shuttle has left, but we do have shuttles that come in and out on prearranged. And um, short hauls, when you've been waiting three hours, somebody wants to go somewhere, they let them know, oh, you can get there a lot cheaper and a shuttle can be here in just a couple, you know, there's a lot of that going on. So that's in there in kind of black and white. Um, and smoking is prohibited except in designated areas. All trips must be discussed. I already mentioned that prior to departing. Uh, drivers will not approach, talk to, signal, or communicate in any way with customers unless requested to by the GTO. That is a big point of contention for the drivers. They want to be able to talk to customers one-on-one, -on -one, and I want our GTO to talk to customers one-on-one. -on -one. If a customer approaches a taxi cab driver and has a question, then they certainly feel free to talk to them. But we do not want taxi cab drivers walking away from their designated area or away from their vehicle, approaching people and starting to talk to them. If someone has a question about transportation, we, we our anticipation is that they will use the ground transportation officer who will be a person there in uniform, visible. So um, typically flights arrive at the same time, or you know, people arrive on a flight at the same time, they pick up their bags, they go out to the curb. I've seen, uh, you know, like four people come out there at the same time mm -hmm. to get cabs. So they would be, the, the drivers would be required to sit there and not talk to these customers while the GTO is engaged with the first passenger? No. If a cab, if a customer walks over and says, hey, I want your cab, how much? They talk to them. What I'm talking about is GTOs leaving vehicle to initiate conversations with customers on their own. Customer walks over to, I'm sorry, I said GTO, I meant a cab driver. Customer walks over to a cab driver, starts asking questions. They're certainly welcome to discuss that with them. Well, I would seem to be Essentially, that's to a no solicitation? Th yeah, we have right. huge problems with solicitation, big problems. That's one of the main reasons for that. But the phrasing of that is basically would suggest that they're not allowed to talk to customers unless the GTO says they can talk to customers. But what you're really aiming at is they shouldn't be read attempting to solicit okay. the customer. Well, read the last one. That kind of covers it. Right. Yeah. Authorized yeah. by or directly approached by the customer. So those things yep. are okay. I think I agree with Bruce. That could be worded better. Yeah. Okay. No solicitation is very clear. 
and that's that all over the isn't. permit like i said we didn't go over the permit requirements but that's been on every permit requirement since 95 and it continues on this one and we do this to prevent that but i will put the soliciting word in there and okay. i will let them i will also clarify that when they're approached directly by a customer they're welcome to speak to them okay. it's just i don't need them cutting in front of a gto or leaving their vehicle or their designated area to walk across to talk to a customer about something okay Thank and you. also if i'm a customer and you're cab one and i've engaged you in a conversation do not want cab driver number two coming in to get in on that conversation that will be a big no-no that will be a violation okay so like I said, they seem really strict and kind of onerous, and in some sense they are, but um, we kind of start out strict and then they'll morph a little bit as we go and we'll have, we'll have this revised. <coughs> Questions? <laughs> yes, we do have a speaker. I wanted to see if any of uh, the commission members had any questions. Well, I actually have several questions. Um, so typically when we set rates, we sort of com benchmark them against other airports uh, for many of our rates. Um, how do these rates compare to our, you know, kind of pool of comp airports? Um, I did not benchmark them against other airports. I can tell you that they're pretty reasonable. I checked with several others, but uh, initially I started off with a higher rate and was able to lower it once I got uh, some trip information and um, like I said, we want to keep it to the minimum so that the cost passed on to the customer is as little as possible. Um, so the short answer is that we are uh, very close to many other airports. There's also other airports that have a fee that's less, but they're charging to drop off and pick up. We only charge for pickups. So will these fees be reviewed on an annual basis and comped against other um, airports as to our other fees? They will be reviewed annually, yes. And as part of that review, will we be able to get a comp against other airports as well? I know everybody's conditions are different, but you know it is all part of the the cost structure somewhere. Okay. If the commission would like that, I'm sure we could do it. It's, okay. It wasn't the uh, initial intention because should those benchmarks be much lower, we want to make sure and keep a program that we can um, pay for. Staying, right, I understand that. And, you know, my, my larger question is that, I mean, this is a much bigger program than what we've had in, in the past. I mean, it is a program. And, you know, we it, it seems like there's all these other little costs that, you know, oh, well, we might have to have a booth. And, oh, there's going to be some signs printed up. And then there's um, there's permitting and paperwork and, and monthly reports by these carriers. Um, do you have an estimate of the amount of administrative uh, FTE that's going to go into administering the program here? You've got, I mean, the rates we saw, or the costs we saw, we really just saw the $25 an hour for, you know, the GTO and then, um, some costs for the software and, and so forth, but how much FTE time uh, are you expecting to go into issuing these permits every month and collecting these reports and what are you doing with all these reports, uh, the analysis? And I mean, to me, it sounds like it's approaching a quarter FTE of administrative work to administer this program. It is, yeah, and we have uh, existing administrative staff that will will handle that we have um an administrative specialist right now who issues taxi cab permits and has worked on this with me and works on um, with the police department on their requirements so uh, she's very familiar with the taxi cab requirements and is familiar with this and and knows that she'll be taking on this program and i would say that your estimate of about a quarter time is pretty accurate so, I mean, already the program as a whole is kind of just, just with the GTO costs and the, the software costs and the uh, depreciation of your, your equipment there is just kind of breaking even. So we probably a quarter of an FDO, make up a number, is probably at least 25K a year, you know, 
probably mm -hmm. more with all your overhead and you yeah. know, benefits and so forth. So it's the program's sort of underwater out out at the gate. But I'm, I, I don't get me wrong. I, I, I certainly applaud trying to, you know, have a, a real quality ground transportation program. But you know, it is it's it's a bigger program than what we've had. Yes, so it is. I mean, okay. we have nine companies with permits, and at one, you know, we've had 18 cabs, and I think we're at 16 now. So, and they uh, pay monthly. Mm -hmm. So we do, um, we collect fees monthly, and then we deal with replacement permits when vehicles are being mm -hmm. cycled out or right. worked on, and we have replacement vehicles. So yeah, there is definitely administrative work involved, and we do have an existing staff person to absorb the additional. Will the quality of service being offered by the airport for ground transportation be significantly different than anywhere else in the city of Santa Barbara? And we, we, we're generating a whole lot of rules and, and requirements. Are they, uh, would these not also be applicable anywhere else in the city? These are developed just for the airport and uh, they'll be covered under um, Title 18 of the city ordinance under the airport section. So the specific rules for the airport will not apply anywhere else. I believe that we will offer the customer um, kind of a more organized program to where when they walk out of the terminal building, they'll be able to cross the street and there'll be a person there that can give them assistance They'll have some signage so they know where to go to, to pick up a particular type of commercial ride, whether it's a shuttle or a cab or a limo or a TNC, and, and somebody that they can go to with questions is what I see as the difference. And that's a big difference because that person that answers questions is also there to you know, check permits and coordinate drivers. And so I think in that sense it is significantly um, better than what's available elsewhere in the, the city. Right now, If I, I don't know of anywhere else that has anyone to assist somebody needing that. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of cabs come right down to the waterfront when big ships land. And other than that, uh, some at the train station that stage at the train station, but that's typically just a few. Uh, are you aware of what cab age requirements other airports might have as well in terms of kind of comparable, you know, do other, I, I assume some other airports have a s similar program and... Most have, have similar <coughs> programs. Some are much, much more strict. Mm -hmm. It just really depends on the airport. It's all over the board. You can go down to Orange County, but they've got so many people. I mean, no cab older than two years old. Everything's alternative view. Everybody's mm -hmm. in a white shirt, black pants, mm -hmm. name tag. It is the best looking cab line in the <laughs> United States. Okay. And I would throw in there as a point of comparison for our rental cars. Our rental cars are not allowed to be any older than two years. So, and I think okay. that's the benchmark just about everywhere for airports. Okay. Thank yeah, you. a lot of airports don't allow a vehicle older than um, <coughs> five or seven for a cab, they really, you know, for on-demand cabs. When it's pre-arranged and you're calling, you're mm -hmm. just zipping in, stop at the curb, pick up and go. You know, they want you to have the insurance and uh, permits, but they're far less worried about that. It's the yeah. ones that are there all day in the face of the public right. that, you know, we've kind of presented that product for public to walk mm -hmm. up and get into. We want to make sure the vehicle's newer, the dress codes, yeah. you know, they, they'll accept credit cards. Yeah. Well, uh, well, I certainly appreciate the value of, um, and, and the dedication of the taxi fleet that stays out there all the time, but I think we also be, need to be mindful of, of keeping that a sustainable industry and, and putting too many burdens on it. It's, um, you know, well, we've significantly <laughs> changed what we're calling for in the program mm -hmm. because initially they too were just paying $120 a year and per trip fees for each trip. And that would have increased their cost by hundreds of percent. Because um, if you just look at the, even with just the number of trips they're getting now, three or four trips, um, it, would, it would more than triple their cost. 
So what we did was um, change that fee structure, recognizing that they have many, many more requirements on an on-demand permit. Mm -hmm. So we kind of tried to incentivize it with less fees to make up for procedures and equipment that are required. And do we have, I can't remember if early slides, did we have a comparison of basically the impact on these on-demand operators in terms of their costs, annual costs from where they are today and what? Right they now they pay $150 a month for the privilege to operate the two taxi cabs. It right. ends up being 1800 a year for two cabs, so that's 900 a year. But I just want to clarify, right. they pay $150 a month. So whether they're operating one cab or two cabs, they're paying 150 a month. It's a flat fee, you can operate up to two cabs. Okay. Pretty much, for the most part, all of them have been operating two. Um, I think one cop company dropped out or recently one may have lost a cab, but for the most part it's all two. Okay. So it's $1,800 a year, but they just pay monthly. The new one will be require for two vehicles, it would be 2000 a year rather than 1800 but they would have to pay quarterly in advance. Right now they pay monthly in advance. Okay, so that okay. aside from just the annual permit and then the transponder cost, that's pretty much it. There's so the radio the cost, don't forget the oh radio yeah, communication the radio cost. cost. Right. That one yes. kind of caught your attention. And the so name tag. And yeah, that's a, a grill of an <laughs> expense there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Any other? I, go yes, ahead. I'd like to say something. I think it's a it's a really good um, idea to have someone out there um, monitoring what's going on, but not also that we are a tourism destination, and when we greet a customer that comes, they're not floundering, wondering what they can do, and and every, so I think it's a wonderful idea to have somebody welcoming them and helping them rather than just letting them walk out there and doing whatever. It is a wonderful feeling when you have someone say hello to you, what type Correct. of transportation are you looking for? And they're like, well, I want a cab, or I just called Uber, where do I get it? Or, you know, my yeah. cousin's sending a limo. They can just lay it out for them and help them. Mm -hmm. And more than anything else, that's what I'm looking forward to. And the common cards that they're going to have available in the cabs, are they going to have um, are they going to be addressed directly to you so someone can just drop them in the mail and... We'll, we'll have contact info on there, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But for clarification, I wasn't planning on comment cards um, <laughs> that are like pre-stamped. It's just the passengers so they can read what they should be receiving as far as a nice greeting and an air-conditioned cab and, you know, no orders. I want to have a way that they understand how they can point how they can complain. We will, we'll, we'll add the web address where okay. they can register Great. compliments mm -hmm. because uh -huh. we like reading compliments <laughs> as well as complaints and That's you'd nice. be surprised <laughs> when you when you write that we would love to read you know your compliments or concerns both are valuable and uh, and we'll get some. Great. Carl? So I'm not sure I have questions as, as much as comments. Uh, one would be, as Bruce expressed, the concern about the administrative effort that this will take. And along those lines, uh, I would hope that you would seriously consider dropping the paper reports uh, after the first month or two or three when you've confirmed that, that you, your automated systems um, are, are adequate. Uh, it seems to me that we're um, taking the paper reports, now we're adding a, you know, a transponder system which will give you a nice electronic report and we're still requiring paper reports. I can understand that might be necessary for the first three months or so in order to make sure everything's working right, but it would certainly save the cab companies and uh, your own administrative staff to reduce that uh, redundancy as soon as possible. We'll um, look into that. One issue is um, if they're not submitting trip reports, then um, their permit requires them to track trips. And my point is if we send a bill and they say, well, that's way off, we didn't have nearly that many, tracking those reports kind of behooves them to should there be some It's one conflict. thing to ask them to keep the trip report. It's a different thing to send it to you. Okay. and to require it. Right. Um, if, if you say they had 10 rides, 
Well, it's going to be Uber and Lyft primarily, and I presume you're going to that Uber and Lyft are going to send you some money every month based on the app that you're talking about, and there's not going to be any argument or discussion about it. Um, if if your app that links to their app shows that there were X number of trips, that's what you're going to expect to receive, with without any yes. question. Yeah. Um, we will certainly look into that because, as I mentioned, I'm not looking to just continue to drive the cost up. So if, um, if we're sending out billing based on trip reports and we're not getting any, oh, you got it wrong or, you know, that's your system billed me three times for one pickup, some glitch, then, yeah, we'll back off of that. Um, I... I think if I were writing this, I would put the, the dress code as suggested and uh, apply uh, corrective action as needed rather than being so specific and so detailed on the dress code. Um, I don't, I think that's sort of being too big brother overkill to have that dress code. I'd be just as happy to, to say that you have to be neat and presentable, et cetera. And if people aren't that way, then the GTO can, can uh, discuss it with them. Um, you've got it all in there. I guess this went through the committee and you said that mm -hmm. there wasn't any specific argument, but at the same time, everybody hated it. <laughs> Frankly, I guess if I were trying to be a, a professional driver, I would expect uh, and a cab company would expect the people to dress appropriately and not have to uh, have some detailed rules written. So that expectation does not exist. Right. All right. Well, um, here. let's see how those rules work out. <laughs> I, like I say, my comment is I think they're overkill. Um, I also. I can understand the need for a nice, clean, good-looking car. Uh, personally, most of my life I've never owned a car that was less than 10 years old. <laughs> and I'm not sure that, uh, uh, but what, it wasn't neat enough and clean enough to look good on a taxi line. So I would hate to see somebody have to buy a new car just because the airport required a 10-year or newer vehicle as long as it met the other many requirements of no dense things, clean, neat, etc. The last comment is the one thing in there that I thought was really overkill was the on-demand cab who suddenly became prearranged and had to pull out a line. So if I understand this right, there's five cabs sitting out there. I'm a customer. I walk out and say, oh, I always go with Joe there in cab number three. I can walk up to him, get in the cab, and go. But if Joe happens to be cab number six over there in the parking lot and I call him up and say, hey, Joe, come pick me up, now he has to be a, a suddenly a prearranged cab. He's already paying his $1,000 a year and doing his duty. And if I had waited three minutes, maybe he would be number five in line and I could get him anyways. To me, that's sort of overkill. If you're an on-demand cab and I happen to call you uh, because you're not one of the five sitting in line, then he ought to be able to come up, I hop in and go, and it's covered under on demand, not under prearranged. That's the end of my comments. Okay. Anyone else? We have a speaker also, don't we? Oh, yes, but I'm trying to get our comments first. Okay. <laughs> well, I might have some other comments after <laughs> our speaker. Okay. And if it's uh, okay with you folks, we will ask our speaker, um, George Sakalara. And thank him for his patience. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone, please. <coughs> okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is George Sakilarev, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my company, Yellow Cap, and the other on demand cap companies and drivers. I'm here to appeal to you to halt the implementation of these new rules and regulations. And I'm not talking about the other commercial transportation services only for on-demand cabs. I ask you to separate us from the rest of the ground transportation services 
when decisions are made because we have a completely different business model than they do and we are already regulated they are not yet and uh, ladies and gentlemen many cap companies in our town are rapidly going out of business the facts according to Santa Barbara Police Department are 17 cap companies have gone out of business the last three years four in 2017 alone so far and uh, including absolute cap what's uh, was a rather large company last year yellow cap my company had 16 drivers now we're down to 10 and we had over 30 before the last recession i'm not suggesting that you're responsible for our declining business but i do suggest that your new rules will help to push many of us over the edge even faster than before i cannot afford to buy a new car i cannot afford to buy a new taxi cab right now if it were not for my wife's income as a nurse at cottage hospital i would not even be able to pay for food and rent to support family i believe that most taxi cab drivers are in the same boat and many of us wonder if we will even be in business next year i urgently appeal to you to help us stay in business by halting what you are doing to investigate further these issues i feel also that the airport subcommittee last week did not listen to us when we spoke at their meeting we had three speakers talking about six issues and uh, that's because they didn't debate our issues in our presence they seem to accept tracy lincoln's proposals as a given and adjourned the meeting after we spoke and like in conclusion i would like to add that no fees will be imposed on on-demand cap companies and the car replacement rule be discarded altogether go by the condition of the cars and uh, let's mention Santa Barbara Police Department maintain mandates uh, stickers quarterly stickers what are from licensed mechanic and uh, that proves that our cars are safe for the road and I know my two minutes are up but if you give me more time I can answer questions or um, I'll give example for example for especially for the car replacement rule would you like me to to give a, just an example a minute for example we have a, a car what's mercedes is on the line if we go now and open the door of the car not me not any of us will guess how old is that car we would like all of us will like that car and we'll like to get the right with that car and if we have cars like this with immaculate showroom condition and they are eventually nine years old or eight years old or ten years old that means will be arbitrary like mr trancy lincoln mentioned to get this car off the road because just for the years it's made and uh, basically okay if I have a question. Yes, please. What are you suggesting as far as um, how old the car should be? I suggest to go with the condition of the car. Like, I repeat, my, I will repeat myself because this is important that our cars are safe for the road because they are inspected by licensed mechanic and its inspection is close to 40 points. Uh, I don't have that number, but it's close to 40 points. For example, other services have 20 or close to 20 or 18. I read something about Uber or something. Doesn't matter. I don't want to mention Uber. Um, so that uh, gives us the right from Santa Barbara Police Department to be on the road. Otherwise, if we don't pass that inspection or we get the city sticker, we are not going to be on the road. And um, what else about the car the car the Could, uh, also um, the, the the way the car look the way the car look the car is supposed to look nice we all know this is cosmetic rule we agree for that rule we like our cars to look nice so for example if a seat breaks driver goes and buys new seat you don't buy a new car and if you have perfect seat so for other example we have for example two two drivers bought um, vans recently six months or something both vans are questionable for the years the arbitrary decision for the years 
but they are also in very nice condition. So the driver in, in these hard years to operate in cab business, uh, he plans ahead. So they bought these cars. Um, uh, one of the cars was from San Luis Obispo or the other, I can't remember uh, where. But they are on uh, low mileage and uh, uh, perfect seats inside because uh, uh, people who are driving them uh, didn't put a lot of miles on them. They were just sitting in garage park. They were using it, for example, when family comes from out of town or out of state. And then they had like one of the cars was 60,000 miles. So basically, this is a perfect uh, uh, car in perfect condition. What also makes the yearly rule arbitrary. And um, uh, we, you mentioned other airports. Other airports have um, uh, that condition for many years. In, uh, in 2005, many drivers bought Prius, what the Prius was 23, 24,000, but they had more, um, more income at the time, so they could afford the car payment. So the, the drivers, they don't, they don't think they, they don't like new and luxury car for their customers. This is the main thing. So, they, uh, so the drivers, they have the pride to maintain their cars. Thank so, you. So, yes. so you, uh, you started off your uh, talk by saying that, that these rules would potentially put some of you out of business. And you mentioned one specific thing, and that's the 10-year rule. Yes. Are there other specific the items other that you is think I, are... I mentioned that uh, it's hard to, uh, to plan in these years to be in business next year. That's why I gave example that 17 cap companies quit. Our companies are not big. We are not LA with uh, some owners. They own a couple of hundred caps. Um, our companies are mom and pop companies, like so so called. But what specific things in here I'm, are objectionable, I'm, I'm, other I'm, than the 10-year rule? Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to it. So the, the business model is different because well, there is no company to stay behind me. I am the company. The next two drivers, next company on demand what stays in the car, they are the company. There is no company to pay my bills. I pay my bills. I pay the company bills. The drivers pay their bills. That's why I say we can't pretend that we are LAX or uh, other big town with many caps. And the company is, for example, profitable or not that profitable, but there are owners who own body shops and gas stations and a couple of hundred cars. So you rent the cars. No, in our model, we own our cars, so, I, I, so we I, take care of our cars. I, I understand, but you need to give us specific items of what in here is objectionable other than the 10-year rule. Well, you uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was... Um, um, if the 10-year rule... Fee, the, the upfront fee uh, to be taken um, uh, monthly uh, because it's non-refundable. And uh, if, if you are the company, if you are the driver, Nobody will refund that money to me or other driver if he leaves next month, even if he doesn't plan to. So it's just um, uh, we're losing the money. But if if we if some other driver come to fill up the spot, they will pay the new monthly fee because they'll start new business. Okay. So if the driver leaves, uh, uh, the the money are gone anyway because they're non-refundable. So the money should the so the the price should be. Monthly? You would rather as have as monthly as rather than annual been, paid quarterly? Been. Yeah. Are there any other specifics? Well, I, I think it was beyond monthly. It sounded like you objected to having to pay for the whole year? Yes. Is that not upfront fee. So we not upfront fee. We changed it from yearly to quarterly. But that's just quarterly the installments. Exactly. Right. Annual. But it's still right. a but minimum. But it's still a minimum of, of that. One year. Correct. It's any, it's any other any other specific things? You, you mentioned there were six items that were brought up. Okay, these were two. The um, uh, main thing is the Grand Transportation Officer. Um, when when uh, you come to my taxi, I I have the right to meet you, and uh, uh, when you're coming, you ask me where you. Uh, I ask where you where you're going, or you ask you tell me where you go and. Uh, for example, we negotiate uh, many, many, many times the, the price is negotiable. If the GTO meets the customer before me, he will give price what might be different if they talk to me. The price is not set. Um. There is no set price. 
So could be if you like for discount, uh, for example, 10% or 20%, that's what it is. Tracy, we're, I wasn't aware that this officer is going to be giving prices. Mm. Is, is uh, the officer to give uh, prices? The officer will have information available that is the same information on the doors of the taxi okay. cabs that list their prices right now as we speak. The requirement for the city of Santa Barbara, and it has been for as many years as I've been here and actually much longer than that, is that taxi cab companies can state what their rates are and they can have several different rates, but their rates need to be posted on the door. And so okay. that is okay. how our short haul fee becomes legal because it's not a reader mate, it's not a meter rate, but it's posted there. So okay. it is legal okay. in that fashion. So I'm not aware of negotiating prices that are posted on the door. But yes, it is the intention of um, staff to make sure that the ground transportation officer has the current prices of the permit holders for the airport. Uh, cabs are supposed to have that on file with the city, and if they change it, they need to submit it 30 days in advance. But okay. different operators have different prices, is that That's correct? The city so the, the, the GTO would then look to see what car's in the front. I, I guess I'm not clear, other than providing general pricing, why the GTO should be discussing pricing. Yeah. Well, it's uh, not the intention that the GTO discuss price, but they'll have them available in case they're questioned about it they'll have what the current pricing is for each of the permit holders listed with the city. Mm -hmm. it's, they're not going to be constantly offering up. If they're asked a question, what's a cab ride, the answer will be the cabs have different rates. You don't have to pick the first one. You can look at the rates on the door. And if they ask what the rates are on the door, if they want to look, then they would be able to view them. But yeah. no, we're not. Okay. Offering that up. But you know, so. his concern was uh, restraining their ability to negotiate with, negotiate down with the customer, it sounds like. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that the concern but that you, you're not having the ability to negotiate presumably down with the customer, not yeah, you, 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 Mr. Lincoln is right and all of you are right, but if you come to me and I smile and say, yeah, to downtown is $40 plus tips, how, how about you smile back and say, yeah, it's 36 doors, we can go for 33, and I know the celebrities who live on the way, and I can entertain you, and we wine tours, and this and that. I'm losing all this uh, small talk if there mm -hmm. is somebody yeah. to meet the customer before me. I'm losing the small talk, I'm losing the, the fun of the job, I'm losing, I'm losing the customer. Okay. It's not my customer, it's GTO's customer. He'll, uh, for example, you, you come toward the cabs and they say, yeah, downtown is $40, and that's it. But other thing is, if, if I'm uh, standing there, or the other cab drivers, and, uh, <coughs> and it's, just, it's just different. Welcome mm -hmm. to Santa Barbara, if you see somebody who you know, and mm -hmm. you know, welcome back if it's a uh, customer you know, people who live in town, many things like that. So, okay. uh, so that was a couple of the, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't think the intention of the GTO is anything we but to, to direct yeah, but information and passengers can walk up to you and have a conversation and that's what we're expecting they will do. Does anybody here have any thought that their GTO would do anything else? They are I mostly think the GTO will be so busy they won't have time to do anything else. But that isn't the intent <laughs> of the GTO no. anyway, right. to welcome the customer and yeah, walk his, them over. His interface is mostly with the customer. When the customer comes to you and he's told he can pick any cab, he can go to you, discuss to his heart's content, and I'm assuming if he doesn't like what you say, he can go to the next cab and Correct. ask him what he thinks. So I don't think there's any, the GTO is not supposed to be a policeman for the cab company's pricing. Right. You folks, mm -hmm. all he's trying to do is provide information to somebody from East Hanover who has no clue of how it works. To it. Because in a lot of places, you have to take the first cab. Yeah. And it's very nice to know that, no, you can take whatever right. cab you like. In a lot of places, There's the cab rates are also set. Correct. And so right. all the intention is that they can let them know the cab rates are not set. They're posted on the doors. You're not required to take the first one. And then other questions that they have will we'll help yeah. them. I, I, see it, I see it as an assistance to letting people choose who they like. And you look nicer than the first guy, so go right ahead and 
take this nice gentleman in the third cab. Or I, like the Mercedes. I think you said there were six items, and I think we've covered three of them. Do you have three? The uh, uh, the ground transportation officer, the cars. Then came the uh, Mr. Lincoln. Uh, was uh, very nice to adjust the thing for the badge. Will be just um, the name. Mm -hmm and uh, not uh, the other things would go around it. So this was one item. And uh, many of the drivers argued the transponders since we don't pay, uh, since we don't pay the, per trip the front, the, the, the per trip fee. Um, we have uh, mandated by Santa Barbara uh, Police Department uh, log sheets where we have all the rights and we keep it like uh, now it's three years the rule used to be five and uh, also if you work with dispatcher the dispatcher has double uh, uh, how you call it double tracking the, they also have the rights if you work with dispatcher and um, so we can always give the rights from the log sheet because it's official document for um, Santa Barbara Police Department or uh, uh, for the taxes so that's how we get our uh, taxes filled for the income. So that was one other thing that um, we can give, um, uh, since we're going to give per trip uh, uh, copy of our log sheet, that's, uh, that's enough for the... Okay. Anything else? Go, well, uh, was so could I, if I may ask you about your uh, There is uh, Manusha in the, like, uh, the shorts. I'm the only one wearing shorts, please. <laughs> Um, so you're logging. I, I assume you don't just come to the airport, take somebody someplace, then come back to the airport and take somebody someplace. You probably have other traffic, uh, other fares you, you deal with. So yes, yes, we do. with our requirement to submit a log... You can have all the log. Then, okay. It's so official. But just send the whole log yeah. and, and you would do that. So then our it's not administrative different person would have to sit there and highlight the ones that... Kind so my day have looks like I start 4.30 this morning for the Denver flight. I have a personal I brought to the airport like uh, sure, 4.35. Okay. That's that's not pick up from the airport, but it's on the log sheet. Well, it sits well, there. Sure. I, well, I, if, if it were me doing it, I would just send the whole thing too. But um, So is our requirement to have a special a, a log that was just airport fares? They need to send a log of airport trips. Yeah. And may it have other trips as well? They can just make a copy of their logs and line send it? Out. Yeah, very simple. You line out the line ones out. that don't pertain to the airport. You highlight the ones that do pertain or line out the ones that don't, so the only ones that are left. Well, is that is that a burden we're putting on the operators? Then they're going to yeah. have to... Not, well, it's a, it's a the new requirement, though, right? The, new requirement no. is the existing there. requirement for their permit with the city is that they track trips. We just haven't required them to turn it in. And that wasn't a requirement previously Correct. to turn it in. To turn it in. Right. That, it sounds like the city requires them to log these trips, but now you're requiring yeah. them no, to, actually, to make copies. We haven't been requiring them to turn it in, but they're required to if we ask. We just haven't asked. But it, it will become more of a routine thing. So now every month they will be making copies of their logs, which could be dozens of pages, I would imagine, and mailing them to you after they've highlighted the... Not the okay. No, there is no volume like before. I used to yeah. fill up 40, 40 calls a day, a night, uh, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. okay. When my wife was going to school, I was working longer yeah. hours now. Okay. So we, we had the concern about the need to purchase a transponder while you're already being required to produce logs, which to me, I mean, it does seem a bit onerous to do both. Um, Okay. The transponder gives us dwell time, entry time, exit time. It has information far beyond what a, what a, a trip log can get us, and uh, that's not a requirement that we really want to let go of easily. I would suggest <laughs> that it would seem to me to be reasonable at $1,000 a year or whatever it turns out to be that the airport buy a couple of dozen transponders in bulk, which I think you're planning to do already because you're going to sell them back to the various uh, people who need them, um, and that uh, they they essentially, the airport loans out the $40 trans 
ponder for as long as the cab company is continuing to pay their annual fee and when they're no longer interested in being here they'll return it to you and you can give it out to the next cab company maybe a deposit a required so well, it comes it's back. required uh, and it benefits it's, it's you it's a 40 dollar or a yeah. lost transponder yeah. fee yeah but, uh, think. Uh, i i also would go back to i i could certainly support an older than 10-year car as long as it is in good physical condition and in in good cosmetic condition if it's a a junker um there's one ca one yeah. rental car company that rents junkers and that's perfectly fine if that's what you want but um uh, i don't i i agree mm -hmm. that we don't want junker cabs sitting out there but i would go by condition not by year I, I would I, I would agree with that. I think mm -hmm. cars are much more reliable and better built than they ever were, and I don't personally consider a 10-year-old car, you know, all that old either. <laughs> um, I was curious, do we have an idea of how, what the average uh, age or median age of our current cab fleet is and how many cabs of that fleet of whatever it is, 13 or some. Are I, at one are point I knew that, I don't have it off the top of my yeah. head. Well, I, I think it's a, pers a, a fairly significant issue. As I said, I, I think it's important that this, we, we do what we can to sustain this industry. I mean, I, I think overall that's a, that's a great idea. The program's a great idea. It would have been an even better idea 10 years ago before this, this industry was struggling as it is. Um, and I think that particular issue of the age of the cabs is, is fairly significant. If we drive four or five of more of them away, it's certainly not in the, in the public interest to have less on-demand cab service because we're trying to build a better on-demand cab service because having no on-demand cabs left is not a better program. Uh, I'd like to say something that, um, that makes it a lot of our cab drivers, like this gentleman here, is a one person. It isn't like it's some of these large cab companies in Los Angeles or anything like that. So I'd, I would like us to review the 10 year. I don't know where you come up with a, a year. I don't know if you do it. It's no. going to cost more. I mean, it's going to be more work to evaluate the cars and all the rulings behind what it's going to take. If the commission's general feeling is that they'd like that eliminated, we can do that and then take it to council. Okay. I, I, I would certainly like to just do it mm -hmm. on condition. I know there are certainly a older cars that are in very con condition and I'd like to ask why the requirement for an annual fee, even though it's quarterly, um, as has been pointed out, you have individual, you have, you have companies that are a one-person company and to commit, sometimes just to commit to being here for a full year um, and therefore be committed to paying your $250 every quarter, uh, you know, is that necessary? Uh, mm -hmm. I can see that you might want quarterly payments instead of monthly payments just from a, a matter of an administrative standpoint, but I could certainly see nothing wrong with going to uh, quarterly payments uh, where you're you're not committed to the full annual payment. No no refund if the guy gets after a month quits, but um, not a requirement to commit to 12 months. One of the problems with that is that people come zooming in for the busy season. Busy se season. Oh, I want to be on demand just for the summer when there's more. So if that's what the commission would like, we can um, we can do monthly or. Um, well, it, w it would seem to me that quarterly is is a reasonable period of time, yes. um, because so business can change. Um, no one a, is going to see a full year ahead. Um, monthly, I think, would be too short, but I think a, a quarterly permit would be a reasonable length of time. Yeah, I would agree with the, the quarter. I, again, I, I think monthly is just more administrative work as, as much as it's, you know, better for a provider, I think. So you're saying lot. quarterly with no requirement to f continue for the full year? I, I think that's certainly less onerous on the operators. Yeah, I, no, I agree. wouldn't require yeah. a full year. Commitment. Not require a full year, but no. just require a quarter at a time. 
Um, now, would it have to be consecutive? I mean, if you want to show up this quarter and not next quarter, but come the quarter after that, is there any concern? There is a concern because during certain times of the year, there's not as much business. I don't know what the rate, I mean, how it goes with the flow of the airlines, but if you um, have them sign up for three months and when they decide during the winter months that there isn't as much business, we'll have no cabs out there. And I think well, our responsibility is to make sure that we've got on-demand cabs out there. And that's to drive them out of business. Mm -hmm. if you look <laughs> if, but on the <laughs> other hand, if you look at the passenger counts, yes, our passenger Four counts go up and down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they, they go up yeah. from, <laughs> from more than 40,000 to less than 60,000. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like we have a time when nobody shows up here. Also has been pointed out that apparently a number of the cab companies are individual mm -hmm. that l live here locally. They're, it's not like they're going to drive in from someplace else, spend three months here in the summer, and then, you know, go to Vail for the winter. Except that this is an open system, so if you allow that type of payment system, companies can do that. They can come in, they can get a permit with the city of Santa Barbara and come in and do that if they want to provide. I'm, and I'm not saying I have a problem with that. I just want to point that out is it could happen. As you said, you're going to probably reduce some of these requirements in the future after things have settled down. I would suggest that we look at this at at a quarter, to, uh, you know, uh, the the quarterly payment. And if, in a year or six months or whatever, we find that we've got cab companies coming in from out of town for the busy season and then leaving, we can uh, we can turn around and adjust things. George, you had a uh, yes. I I, comment. I I wanted to uh, to say that, um, for example, I am cab driver more than twenty years, and. My daughters went to schools in Santa Barbara with that job and was a lot of more business and volume of business and uh, and foot traffic at the airport. And um, so I'm way past the point to prove commitment because there were uh, words about that we are committed for the business. Right. We are, uh, there are many, many drivers in uh, on-demand service who are more than 15 years drivers. Sure. They we're like not to stay. They like to stay drivers. That's why uh, I was pleading for um, to how I uh, how I said it to make uh, it monthly. No, 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 no. To 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 just when when we make the rules to to look different eyes on us. Uh, it, it's it's not like we like to get out of business or we're planning because I gave examples for how many companies quit. Yeah, but these were actually maybe more non-committed or younger people. It's also we are different age group. Thank you. It's kind of, you know. So um, do I hear a well, There were six issues that were raised um, during the subcommittee. Did we did we hear what those six issues were? His concern was that so. they weren't addressed. And we we addressed um, a couple of the issues. And one of them was that. Um, um, that they don't pay annually, right, so let me yeah, change that. Mm -hmm. And another one was where um, ID badges. Uh, the ID badges. Mm -hmm. The other one was. I've got them listed here. If you'd like me to highlight them. Uh, yeah, because yes, we did list them, okay. and then we Thanks. and then they didn't want to sit in the cab all day. So Tracy was going to find a place that they could go. So I don't know, other than um, the ten year that we didn't address we what did you were looking for. We did address that. They're, they're, okay. they're six, and and also. Like the rest, I called the the manusha thing around, you know, like for us also the dress code we like to be presentable. It's not like we don't like to, but for example, I like to work with shorts, uh, <laughs> not the rest of the cab drivers. So that's why I thought that uh, Mr. Lincoln tried to get me into retirement with him so we can go fishing <laughs> uh, together. And it's, uh, but I still have to work. Well, Thank I would you. certainly be okay with the idea of shorts if they weren't safe. R <laughs> cargo shorts. <laughs> yeah. no, no, but you look nice not today. Not <laughs> I mean, somebody <laughs> coming in that has never been in town would look at you now and be very comfortable. Yeah, I don't work like that. I don't work with Thai. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I try to impress you. <laughs> no, it's uh, a joke. As I said, um, I, you know, there are fine hotels in this town where the valets wear shorts, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So I, I personally don't see that as a problem. But I, I would agree. Well, yeah. that's, that's their also. uniform, and we're not requiring them to wear a uniform, uniform which, right. of course, would be much more onerous. I think we're trying to present a neat and presentable 
Some folks don't look so great in shorts, and they wear them anyway. So I think we're just trying to take into consideration what is a standard of dress for the position and the public who, who's going to be presented with you. And, and representing uh, us, uh, as in Santa Barbara. Right. I mean, it, I'm, yes. I'm in that industry, and it's so important. You've got one opportunity to make somebody feel comfortable, because they'll, they'll judge you on the darnest things, but um, I, I think the dress code is, is important. I, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. that I would change the dress code to include shorts. <laughs> but no, no, I think shorts. it's reasonable <laughs> to expect them to be presentable. Um, and, um, it looks like what we've got here is, is mostly the concern with the age of the yes. car vehicle yes, yeah. issue and the uh, monthly payment. Are you kind of in agreement? Uh, or excuse me, the quarterly payment that quarterly, is, yeah. mm -hmm. has, do we have, uh, I mean, uh, what, what we're going to be voting on is whether or not we want to present these rules. Do we have a well, possible? Well, if, if we could have them amended, I, you know, I, I think, you know, my feeling would be those two items and the be amended. The third thing important or first is how we meet the customer. So the ground transportation mm -hmm. officer doesn't have to interfere. No, he doesn't. With cab business. No. Yeah, that that's we, he, we he have does, to stress that. We he have does to stress. not. Any we customer yes, can yeah, walk up to yeah, you. Yeah, the yeah, the yeah. GTO is there yeah. to assist a customer exactly, if yes. they want that. We assistance. agree on that. We agree on that. So okay. so we're fine with that. Right. So well, I think. I think back to <laughs> back to our discussion on that though. I, we did discuss the wording, changing the wording so that it is more like they're they're not. The intention is that they're not out there soliciting or trying all you know uh, trying to approach the customers um, and. I don't want to change the wording to anything other than they do not approach customers. They can speak to the customer when the customer has approached them and ask a question. GTO is talking to a customer, do not need a cab driver coming up to involve themselves in that okay. conversation. Correct. Same with um, that customer speaking to another driver or someone else. Uh, drivers need to stay in with their vehicles or in their designated areas, which is one of the changes we're talking about making to this. And right. that, and, um, and that that's and we can mention permit, soliciting. The conditions? Pardon that, me? That text is in the conditions, is that right, as opposed to the regulations? Yes. And we're yes. being asked to approve the right rules and regs? Um, or the entire program includes the conditions and the fees, yes. So you're being requested to yeah. move yeah. the pro, recommend to the city right. council yeah. that they repeal the existing resolution that just implements fees and other requirements upon on-demand drivers and replace it with this new program that has fees, rules, procedures, and uh, permits for all types of operators that we've discussed tonight. If you want to move the program forward with the changes that we've discussed, we can do that. Yeah, I, I would say I have concerns about the sustainability of on-demand uh, service here if we have those, you know, the, the age requirement and that full annual there. I think that could serve to drive more of the on-demand operators off of the field, which I think is contrary to what we're trying to achieve. So I, agree. I would not support um, approving it with those two conditions, but if uh, I would approve it on the condition that we eliminate the, th or, or make the operating fee quarterly, and uh, that... I think it is. Or, or you no, mean it's with billed, it is quarterly. billed but, quarterly. But it's an annual license right. fee. No, make it that it is, you know, renewable an uh, quarterly, essentially. Right. It is a quarterly fee. Uh, and that we have wording basically, I think we already have, we have wording that the, the vehicle shall be good and safe um, and that no dents, free of damage, hubcaps, uh, you know, maybe. <laughs> no torn seeds and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and, you know, it, I don't know if we need it further. I mean, maybe if we amplified the condition you know, slightly uh, to just allow us to then um, eliminate the 10-year requirement, I, I would support it. I, I, I would 
agree with that completely. That I think actually the condition requirement is is adequate. Has, as it is, is is adequate. Um, there's always the uh, uh, the director's you know final decision, but um, I'd eliminate the ten year. I would uh, certainly agree with the uh, renewed quarterly, and um, I guess if there's not enough support for shorts, we'll leave that out. Um, Thank you, Dolores. But th at least those two items, <laughs> and shorts. I would I would say the rest of it is uh, is good, and I do think we should ask for this to be brought back to us a year after it's been implemented for a a review as to how things are going, and that would include uh, another subcommittee meeting at which the taxi cab and other uh, um, stakeholders are invited to to give their feedback after it's been in, in place for a year. I think it's very important that um, you know that just like the public, if there's an issue and you see something that you're not comfortable with, as in you think that this person might make it impossible for you to negotiate, you also have the right to come back and let the airport know that there's an issue. I appreciate this. So it's thinking. not that, that you know this is going to yeah. happen and we don't want to hear about it. We do want to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate for the commission, I will point out that any violations that are issued during this program, as a result of this program, um, can be appealed, and the airport commission is the appeal body. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. So, and just because uh, we didn't spend a lot of time on disciplinary procedures, there was not a lot of concern with the drivers and operators regarding the disciplinary procedures, and the subcommittee was relatively happy with them, but um, there are guidelines that we issue, and we're dealing with verbal warnings where companies are notified that their driver got a verbal warning because their driver had a violation and we don't issue we just issue the verbal warnings we let them know the violation occurred so is the guidelines are two warnings before any permit violation occurs so uh, it's a very good system in that sense to where it has driver company operator and city talking about each issue before violations go out so um, the drivers were pleased with that flexibility and the uh, the city attorney uh, liked it as well. So, good, well, good I would yeah. I would make a motion that uh, okay. we approve the program with the amendments that the on-demand vehicle business operating agreement be a two hundred and fifty dollar a quarter fee, and that we eliminate the ten year age requirement. Second. On the vehicles. Is, no. okay, is there any discussion <laughs> of yeah. the motion along with its amendment? No. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we repeal the current regulations. Recommend to City Council that they do that. Recommend to City Council that they repeal the current regulations and implement the new program with the changes uh, re uh, eliminating the 10 year uh, age rule on the cars and allowing for quarterly payments yeah, uh, the that the rate for on-demand business operating agreement is 250 a quarter okay a renewable stated. quarterly it is a quarterly fee yeah I don't know that I want to say renewable quarterly that has people filling out a new permit application yeah. each quarter and that creates a lot of extra okay. work we just pay the fees quarterly for an annual permit. but not required on an annual. Uh, uh, there's no commitment beyond the quarter any discussion before we vote? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. The motion passes. Good. Thank you. Appreciate the commission's time. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, I, operator I, representative. Uh, and I think that also <laughs> brings us to the uh, end of the meeting. If yes. there are no other items, <laughs> we are adjourned. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah.